Welcome. I'm Gillian Mackay, MSP member of the Cross Party Group on Disability, and I would like to welcome you all to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. This evening's panel is titled Employability versus Employability and is held in partnership with Inclusion Scotland and Disability Equality Scotland. We are delighted that so many people are able to join us online today, and I look forward to hearing your comments and questions from you as we get into the discussion. We are pleased to offer BSL interpretation for today's event and look forward to receiving questions and comments. So what exactly does employability versus employability mean, and how welcoming and inclusive are companies when it comes to disabled people? Are people being treated as equal and valued employees in the workplace? This panel aims to address all of these questions in the next 60 minutes, so do stay with us. We are delighted that you are able to join us to take part, and I would encourage you all to use the event chat function to introduce yourselves stating your name and your geographical location, and pose any questions you would like to the panel. I am very pleased to be joined by our panellists, Paula Gray, who is Head of HR with STV, Gary McLean, Inclusion Scotland intern with Save a Life for Scotland, Alex Wilson from Inclusion Scotland, and Brian Scott from the Glasgow Disability Alliance. There will be an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. If you would like to make a contribution, please enter them into the question and answer box, which you can find on the side. Make sure to state your first name and where you are this evening, and we will get through as many as possible. However, to start this evening, I would like to begin by asking each of our panellists what they think about this new term employability that has been coined by Inclusion Scotland. And do they agree with its meaning? I will first come to Paula, then Gary, then Brian, and then Alex. So, Paula, what are, what are your thoughts on this, please? Um, so, I think the, the term is very good at conveying the ability of employers to create inclusive employment experiences, and it, and it helps to, to draw out the focus um, of the, the power that we have to do that. And within each of our organisations, Think of the, the journey that colleagues are going on in terms of being attracted to our organisations uh, through the networks that we are advertising, through the actual application process, through the point of induction and onboarding, and then on to their career and development with each of our organisations. There are small changes that we can make that can make a, a big difference uh, to individuals and really enable them to thrive through that process and to, to thrive in their environment. Um, so some of the things that we've been thinking about, sort of taking each of those in turn uh, through that attraction stage of, of the networks that we're trying to to reach out to, um, working actually with Inclusion Scotland has been something that's been you know, very helpful for us in thinking about how we how we describe our recruitment adverts, the language that we're using, which skills are you know are are excellent communication skills truly essential to that role. Or is there another way that we can convey actually what's required um, so that we're not causing candidates to, to rule themselves out of the application? Um, and we, when we worked on the intern programme uh, with Inclusion Scotland, actually through the interview process as well, we were able to think about all the different adjustments um, that were very important for candidates and make sure we're making that process as accessible as, as possible. Um, and then things like accessibility software as well for online systems. Can make a huge difference in terms of people uh, being able to just customise content in the way that works for them, be that font sizes, screen colours, um, you know, it's a text to speech functionality, accessibility features that can make a huge difference uh, to somebody's experience of that application process and making it clear in your advert um, that you're, you're very willing to make those adjustments. And then through the onboarding process, often it's different systems that we use as an organisation when somebody's actually in and working with us. Then it might be through the application process. So through our induction, again, making colleagues aware that we have a real focus on this as an organisation, um, and we want them to feel able to come to us with any ongoing reasonable adjustments they might need. Also, letting them know what reasonable adjustments are, uh, sorry, accessibility features are available as standard in our systems. You know, so through Teams and Office and Microsoft Outlook, what accessibility features are there as standard, and if there's more customised support that an individual might need in their ways of working, 
you know, where can they access that through IT teams, through our occupational health, you know, how, how can we kind of make that available? Um, and then you know, ongoing development um, of individuals and thinking about equality of opportunity and progression and, and training within, a, within the company so that other colleagues we can continue to raise that cultural competence and awareness so that you know, people feel able to have the conversation um, about what adjustments might be required and you know, know that they can go to their manager and, and speak about that. And so again, we looking at different training there um, to try and break that down into a way that's digestible um, for all colleagues and for people in a position of influence, like hiring managers, you know, looking at the different types of access requirements that colleagues might have across physical uh, disabilities or sensory or learning, you know, the different types um, of access requirements that may arise and how we can try and make those processes as streamlined for people as possible should they, they ask for support. So I think the term, you know, really captions the fact that it's within our gift as employers um, to be able to, to look at those areas and where we can make adjustments. Great, thank you, Paula. Um, so could I come to Gary next, please? Hi, yes. Hi. Uh, well, for me, employability is really all about focusing on organisations and employers themselves and what they can do to be more inclusive and welcoming, as opposed to candidate having to sell themselves. Um, it's what an employer can do to make their post attractive for a disabled candidate, um, rather than an applicant, you know, trying to sell themselves um, if they even get to that point. So it's all about making the recruitment process more inclusive, more accessible. And but it goes beyond that. Um, as Paula said, beyond hiring, you've got to. It's about ongoing support as well throughout employment to make sure that people can contribute and participate fully. And I think it's important that you know people with disabilities are given equal opportunities for personal development and promotion. Um, and so you know I think that a term like this you know might help us improve that um, and improve the the disability employment statistics, which are. You know, quite woeful. Um, so yeah, I think um, I fully agree with it, and uh, I fully support it, and um, I think it's good. Fabulous, thank you. Could I come to Brian next, and then we'll go to to Alex finally on this question. Yeah, thanks, Gillian. As a disabled persons organisation, we really warmly welcome this focus upon employability. It's something which I think able people have identified for quite some time has been missing from the debate around how we address the disability employment gap. So much of the focus in the past has been on the disabled job seeker and often a kind of deficit model as if that is a problem the individual who needs to be fixed. I think from our perspective, there are many, many factors that underpin the persistence of the disability employment gap, but I think one of them which is really significant is the capacity and the confidence of employers to implement the best practice when it comes to recruitment and retention of disabled people. And I think the focusing on employability is really helpful because we are approached as a disabled persons organisation by employers who are minded to be more inclusive and who want to, to, to do better in terms of how they recruit and retain able people, but often lack confidence or skills or, or knowledge to know how best to do that. Uh, and I think it's really welcome, actually, that employers are starting to, to you know, be honest about that and say, we'd like to do more, we would like to be more inclusive, we'd like to have a more diverse workforce, we're not sure how to attract applicants, we're not sure how to for example, somebody's workplace support needs, uh, and I think it's really healthy we're starting to have this discussion. And I think from that we can really engage with employers who are minded to be more inclusive. I think that will result in increased recruitment of disabled people, which hopefully will go some way to addressing the disability employment gap. Because, you know, as Gary pointed out, the, the figures for employment rates of disabled people are you know, appalling and have been for quite some time. But in short, we really welcome this focus. So coming to um coming to Alex last, please. Hi, thank you, Julian. 
and um, I, I can just have to agree with everything that's been said previously. I, I think everyone's been really nailed it in terms of our perspective. Um, certainly, um, similar to Brian at uh, the Glasgow Disability Alliance Inclusion Scotland, we're a disabled people's organisation. So um, we work with employers and individuals every day of the week, trying to basically um, uh, remove that fear factor that Brian alluded to himself earlier on. And um, this term that we've um, um, come up with a definition for is maybe basically turning the the normal discourse on its head, if you like, is how can I, as an individual, sell myself to an organisation? It's a recognition that it's a two-way process, that the organisation has to be open and welcoming to the individual applicants as well. And the way they can achieve that is very much through the systems and processes. And um, if anything, I think Brian began to allude to it there, that um, some of the different models of disability, if I may. I don't want to go into this tonight, because it, it's another conversation for another day, but I, I would suggest that the employability is an extension of the social model of disability, where it's not the it's not the disability itself; it's the barrier. It's what the barriers that society put on us, and again, suggest that the you know the systems, the processes, the culture of an organisation, perhaps historically, have been those barriers. And this definition of employability is about trying to break down those barriers moving forward. Thank you. Yes, absolutely, and I think I would wholeheartedly agree with with everything that's been been said there by by our panelists. Um, so thank you for your for your opening remarks. We're now going to um, move on to some questions that that I have before we head on to um, some questions from the audience. So I think this one I'd like to come to to Gary first and get his perspective on this. So. Um, what actually defines an employer as disability inclusive? And as a as a former inclusion um, Scotland intern myself, I I very much have a view on this. But um, Gary, it'd be lovely to hear from yourself of of your experiences and what you think um, an employer to you is when we say they're um, disability inclusive. Well, I think it's just understanding, you know. Um, People, employers who consider, you know, a disabled perspective, and look at your needs, um, you know, at all stages of work. I mean, I've worked for employers who aren't, aren't disability, disability inclusive, and employers who are, and you know, the difference is night and day. You know, things like flexible working, uh, you know, understanding when it comes to hospital appointments and stuff like that, and you know, um, just um, you know, support in general, um, and the willingness. To make those adjustments, as Paula alluded to earlier, I think is important. Um, I think you know a lot of organisations don't realise that you know this tiniest adjustments um, could open their, them, them, them up to um, you know employing um, lots of different type of people. Um, so yeah, just an openness and, an, and a willingness to um, engage and make those adjustments. I think um, yeah, and really to try and understand it from a perspective of that, the person themselves. Yeah, and helping them um, if there are any issues throughout. You know, I know for me personally, I've got lots of hospital appointments, and that was always an issue in my previous employment. Um, you know, it was always as if I had to contribute more because I, I was going to hospital more, and I had to make up for it somehow. You know, as if it was my fault. Um, whereas my current employment, you know, it's much easier um, through Inclusion Scotland. Actually, it's an internship, and I think it's because they they came from it. You know, they're looking. They've came to Inclusion Scotland. They're looking to employ a disabled person. They're actually looking for that perspective in their own organisation. I think that's the difference. That's excellent. Thank you. We'll come to Alex next. Hi. Um, question was around what makes an employer disabled confident. Was it Julian? Or? What makes an employer um, disability inclusive? Mm. I, I, yeah, I must admit, I was thinking about that question earlier on today, and I don't think I've got an answer to it, to be honest with you. Um, I, I don't think there's an end point for this. I think it's a, a continuous journey. And um, I, I would suggest that you know, for any of the protected characteristics, it's um, 
it's a, it's an organic process. It's ongoing and ongoing all the time. And, and um, personally, I would struggle to define what that would look like, I, I, just from my perception that we're constantly striving as a society to be more inclusive and accessible. And I don't think we'll ever finish that job. Excellent. Thanks for that. Uh, we'll give two seconds to allow the interpreters to to swap over. Thank you. And I'll come to I'll come to Brian next on this one. Yeah, it's a really interesting question, and I think Gary absolutely kind of nailed it in terms of the most important characteristic of a, a disability inclusive employer is how able they are to, to make workplace adjustments and reasonable adjustments and to address people's workplace support needs. That's really the, the essential uh, ingredient, if you like, of being inclusive. But, but for me, there are some, some other considerations that I think a really disability inclusive employer is one that has disabled people working throughout the workforce and at different levels within the organisation, because we know in the past, historically, a lot of disabled people have been you know, disproportionately represented at lower entry level jobs and often underemployed. So, for me, disability inclusion is about uh, progression opportunities and people uh, working at all different levels within the organisation. Uh, and something else which you know, is maybe more kind of nuanced, which isn't always kind of considered, which is a really disability inclusive employer for me is one that employs disabled people with a range of impairments and conditions. Uh, because you know that for me would be really evidence that this was an employer that was you know meeting the the kind of workplace support needs of a diverse group of disabled people because uh, you know it, for some people it might be very relatively minor adjustments you need to put in place, but for some other people it might be you know more challenging. And for me, a really inclusive employer would be one that had disabled people working across the organisation and people with a broad range of impairments and conditions. Thank you for that, Brian. Um, Paula? I think a big part of it is, uh, you know, as, as the panel have said, is being able to be responsive, but also um, having things in place as much as possible so that somebody comes in and it's accessible from, from the outset. So being able to think about it uh, ahead of time and and it being evident that you have done that, um, you know, I think it is quite key. We have found with all areas of inclusion, um, and as, as Alex said, um, for any underrepresented group um, where we're trying to make the employment experience as inclusive as possible, it's just, it's quite a long process and it's quite iterative and it's trying to break down um, both ways of working from an employment perspective, but also the way that we undertake our roles um, from an operational perspective what that can mean for individuals um, coming at it from a range of different you know, perspectives and, and sort of vantage points. Um, so for us, that, that was a turning point where we were able to engage colleagues across the business about how they build it into their roles, the, the actual operational side of their roles, because when they were then thinking about their customers and the needs of their customers, it helped them put it into context. And then when we think about it in that, it makes it, um, you know, it makes it more readily transferable into the way that we're all working day to day. So even something like at the moment when we're all, some of us are back in the office working, some of us aren't, you know, hopefully at some point there's a semblance of normality when more of us can be in the office at once and we're thinking about things like future ways of working. You know, we don't want to lose some of the benefits that we've had out of this period in terms of increased flexibility. Um, you know, I've had colleagues say to me, you know, as you said, Alex, it's the, the environment um, that can create the, the, the issue. You know, it's, it's not the disability itself. Um, and actually, you know, where we can make these adjustments, be those physical, where we've had less colleagues um, in the office and there's been greater space, that's actually been very welcomed by some colleagues with mobility. Um, you know, a physical disability, um, or be it our, our ways of working, our sort of our online, um, you know, the adjustments that we can make, just even things like, you know, the, the sort of font sizes that we're using, etc. You know, are these in a way that's accessible for people? And we know that there's, you know, when we come back to the office, we're talking about kind of hot desking and hybrid working, but for some individuals, being required to hot desk and go to a different environment every time you come in, can could cause obviously alarm um, and not be conducive to, the, to that individual thriving in their work. So it's sort of trying to think about these things up front, talk to our colleagues about what we've put in place, but also make it clear that if there's things we haven't considered, you know, that it's very open to come and talk to us about that and, and make those adjustments. 
Great, thank you. Um, so I think I'll come to um, probably Brian on this one first. So how, so what are the real and perceived barriers and challenges stopping a company employing someone um, with disabilities? Obviously, you'll have supported um, interns before. So um, what are the things that, that you're seeing that are maybe sort of perceived by companies, but maybe aren't actually realistic? And probably there will also be barriers that are are realistic that people won't have won't have thought of in the same in the same instance. So your thoughts on that would be would be great. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I, I think there's been some research done in the past as to there's attitudes towards recruiting disabled people and what they perceive the barriers to be. And I think you know so much of this is about misperception and about as you know employers. And this is why employability as a focus is so welcome. Because much of this is based on people, you know, uh, not having information and not being, you know, really aware of what the, the real issues are. Uh, I think that research with employers has, has often highlighted that a significant concern of employers is that if they recruit disabled people, there's going to be issues around attendance and absence, and that, you know that's a worry that if they if they have you know, disabled employees, they're going to require a lot of time off and they're going to need time for hospital appointments and so on and so forth. And in our work with employers, something we frequently have to point out to them is that actually the attendance rate for disabled people is, is usually much, much better than for, for their non-disabled peers. So I think some of this is about perceptions. I think a, a huge issue is that employers tend to have a, you know, a, an exaggerated idea of how difficult or expensive it may be to provide reasonable adjustments. And there, I think there's a Quite a common misperception that many employers have is that if they recruit a disabled person, it's going to be expensive uh, and you know, challenging to, to provide workplace adjustments, and it's going to cause a lot of upset, and it's going to be of concern to other members of staff. When the reality, again, is that we know that for the vast majority of disabled people, reasonable adjustments can be completely at no cost or very inexpensive and often can be provided very, very quickly without any you know, major kind of upheaval for the for the organisation. And then when you factor in things like access to work, which can also help disabled employees. So I think so much of this uh, is about having an honest conversation with employers about what do they perceive the barriers to be, what what are their worries and you know have a safe space for them to talk about that. But then to maybe kind of reassure them that much of this is actually based on misperception and in fact on myths. Paula, can I come to can I come to you next on this? If you have any reflections on the original question, but also if there's any um reflections maybe from yourself in your own in your own role as to whether there were any perceived um perceived barriers that you maybe had um preconceptions about that maybe weren't didn't come true and maybe some that that you maybe hadn't thought of before as well i think um as, as brian said on the perceived side of it i think it's, it's exactly as you've said there brian much of it is about the per sort of perceived cost of the adjustments and the perceived ability you know the perceived ability of the individual to to meet the requirements of the role and that's a particularly um probably troublesome one because we shouldn't we shouldn't draw those perceptions. Um, I guess that takes us into you know things like unconscious bias and all the rest of it that we know is is is, is real as well. Um, and so to challenge our you know our own thought process and not to not to make assumptions um, and to give individuals a full opportunity to demonstrate their ability to meet the role and how they think they could overcome any challenges that that, that there might be in the course of it. Um, the point you made as well about a fear, a danger of getting it wrong. If you, you know, if you if you do get it wrong or you make a mistake, um, I think that can be something that employers are concerned about. But again, having a very open line of communication where an individual can see that um, you know, there's an active uh, desire to to be supportive and um, to, to to have that open dialogue to make sure that the, the adjustments because it's so bespoke, isn't it? What the access requirements might be or what support might be required. So make sure that we're getting it right can often overcome it and it is a perceived barrier. In terms of the real barriers, I think that's actually working with Inclusion Scotland on the internship programme probably gave us confidence as an employer to be able to, because we were 
that was a training opportunity specifically for um, candidates with disability to, to apply for. We were able to be, um, and Alex had actually encouraged us to be open and honest, um, because at the same time we don't want to, we don't want to you know, want to manage expectations. We don't want to give a false sense um, if actually there are certain uh, disabilities that wouldn't lend themselves to the role. So, you know, I think Alex, at the time I recall, you know, um, that due to the nature of the role, for instance, it wouldn't have lended itself to a visual impairment, that particular role, due to the technical equipment that uh, the individual would have to work with. Uh, coming in, so we were honest about that um, in the advertising. But I don't think we would probably have had the confidence to do that if we hadn't been doing it as part of, um, you know, an internship program with the support of Inclusion Scotland. But I can very much imagine, from a candidate's point of view, you would rather have that directness and that openness um, as opposed to potentially going to the effort of going through a process, then to find out, you know, there was a, a, a real barrier, as you say, rather than a perceived barrier. And coming to Alex next, and then I'll come to Gary. Um, last, Alex, from an Inclusion Scotland point of view, you've probably seen and seen and heard it all in terms of perceived barriers versus versus actual barriers. Mm. And I'm sure we could go on it go on at length about that. But if you want to offer no, no, your great... um, your perspective on this, <laughs> no, that's a great it's a great thing to talk about. It really is, and I'm, I just have to concur with what Brian and Paula have said. Really, and I think most of us would agree. Uh, the majority of them are perceived. Um, I think we've had you. Know, there are reality barriers as well, but I think potentially we've had some of those myths busted over the last year and a half. In terms of, it doesn't matter where we live, we can all work from home effectively, and you know, it's a simple thing like that has opened up opportunities for all of us across Scotland. Really, um, a couple of things, if I may. I'm just picking up on Brian's point um, about you know reasonable adjustments in the costs. Um, I think the average cost, Brian, we worked out is about 175 pounds. You know, um, nothing really at the end of the day. Um, what we find, and you know, as a disabled people's organisation, Inclusion Scotland, probably similar to the uh, Glasgow Disability Alliance, employers are just scared of getting it wrong. It's um, the, the, there's this perception that they'll get it wrong. Um, I think, like all of us, we all get things wrong in life. We get it wrong first time, we'll get it right the next time. And this is why we try to work with employers. It's the it's the small. We might come on to talk about it a bit later on. Paul alluded to it. It's the wee things we can all do today as individuals, make our, our ourselves uh, to make our organisation more accessible. Um, Paula began to allude to it, and we try and encourage it even in our emails. Change your emails to what is it? Sans Serif Font 14. Quick win. Suddenly opens up your communications to people with visual impairments. Um, so it's it's just these. Uh, Certainly, from our, our perspective, the majority of them are perceived. And uh, I think, finally, for me, there's this perception that disabled people can't do certain jobs. Um, a question we get asked quite a lot is, in, in terms of language and job descriptions, must have a driving license. Really? The question should be, as long as you can get to that place and back, as long as you can access to your own transport, that's the end of the conversation, really. So it's perhaps as a society again we put our own assumptions onto onto roles that disabled people can uh, uh, actually perform. And what we would encourage is be open, just you know put everything on the table and look at it. And Paula alluded to it. There will be certain impairments that will prevent certain jobs being performed. The internship we were working with STV on. Was in their um, converting um, VHS legacy uh, videos onto digital, um, you know, to create a digital library. So you, you could say that, and, and we certainly worked with STV to put this into the advert that um, that um, you know a visual impairment wouldn't necessarily be a, you would have a visual impairment would be a barrier to doing this role. So there are situations where it, it's legitimate. Um, you know, to uh, to ask for certain um, characteristics in the position, but in general, be open, consider all the options, and don't be afraid. Excellent, thank you. So, finally, coming to coming to Gary, maybe reflecting on on some of your experience of 
of different employers and how you find the the perception of um, making reasonable adjustments versus the reality of what it's actually like um, for a disabled person in an organisation. Yeah, I mean, well, I think I, first of all, I agree with everything that everyone said. You know about misconceptions or a lot of misconceptions around disability and employment. Um, you know, um, I think I agree with Paul as well. Being open is really important. You know, being open and honest from the get go um, with the candidate for me it really helped my confidence um, going through Inclusion Scotland. The fact that I knew that you know they were looking for a disabled candidate. Um, and you know they wanted that perspective and, and the job description right from everything. Um, it just gave me that confidence, you know, that I, I could do this job and um, I could, you know, work in that professional environment. Um, but um, yeah, and that, especially with having a hidden disability, I think like it's not off, it's not always clear that you know you need reasonable adjustments. I think that's for me that was a big barrier because you know I was suffering but it wasn't clear that I was suffering so when I needed time off it was it was a case of you know like um you know why do you need time off you know you're, you're, you're perfectly fine you know so I think you know there's lots of barriers out there um but yeah being open and honest is the best way to overcome them absolutely do you feel Gary, I wonder if you share my my feeling on this as someone with a hidden disability as well. That when you applied for the Inclusion Scotland internship and went through that process, there was almost that feeling of not having to explain yourself and the effort yeah. that 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 took away from it of having to explain um, explain yeah. yourself and explain your access needs and all those sorts of things mm, and how and how that, yeah. and how different that made the process feel for you compared to compared to maybe mm. a normal recruitment process that maybe wasn't as mm. as a uh, as disability inclusive exactly the very fact that they asked you about adjustments you know pre-interview you know it's just you know it's very helpful Right. Rather than you having to go and explain yourself, and you know, that you often find, well, I often find that the second you do that, you think, right, that's it, you're not going to, you're not going to get the job. So, yeah, I think it is it's important, you know, just from a personal point of view, to you know, give you that confidence. We're going to have one yeah. more question. Oh, sorry, on you go, Gary. No, sorry. I mean, you shouldn't have to feel guilty about it, you know, about disclosing a disability. So, you know, I think like. We need to move in the direction, you know, that we're talking about. And I think that that guilt and what you what you said what you said about um, time off for hospital appointments and things like that is actually is probably something that um, any disabled person who's on this who's on this event as well will probably heavily relate to, and that feeling of having to do that bit more before you can be allowed to go for your your hospital appointment and things like that as well, and that's another, that's a whole culture shift that we need to get, that we need to get in, not just with with employers, but through that whole working environment um, thing as well. That hopefully, and that's a much bigger piece of work than we've got time left for this evening. So we'll have one more question from me, and then we'll come to questions from from our audience. So if you have any questions, please get them in through the. Through the Q and A tab on on the event. Um, so finally, for me, how important? And I think I'll come to I'll come to Alex first this time. Um, how important is the backing of the CEO or the board or um, or high up management if inclusion is to become a company policy that actually filters down to day to day employment practices? That's probably coming back to more of the more of the culture shift that we were just talking about there and how. How, if we have sort of higher up management on board, does that filter through to the rest of the the rest of the organisation? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, obviously that's um, extremely important because that, to an extent, you know, defines the organisation and its culture uh, going forward. So, yeah, very much for that. But, um, but again, very much a realist that takes time. Um, to you know, to permeate its way down through an organisation, it, it, it almost demands not only a cultural shift within the organisation, but a societal shift as well. So nothing's in isolation again. 
Um, yes, I completely agree. It, it's, it's, it's important that there's buy-in from the top. Um, but again, I may have touched on it earlier. From our perspective, it, it's what we can all do as, a, you know, as individuals ourselves in our daily jobs to make our workplace more accessible and inclusive. Um, the it's an old hackneyed um, analogy here, but it's like turning an oil tanker mid-Atlantic, isn't it? But that takes a long time to happen. But we can all, as individuals, be much more nifty and swift in terms of what we can do in our daily jobs. Uh, and that can be as simple as I alluded to earlier, change the font size in your emails. Um, as an organization, um, think about where you advertise your jobs. Um, the point Gary made earlier really resonated with me, and it's something we hear all the time. All our internships are ring fenced and only open to disabled people. Um, it is um, it's an epiphany that you get when you see the quality of applicant coming through, and the confidence it gives applicants that because of the end of, because of the opportunity has been ring fenced for you know for disabled people that it's almost like Jekyll and Hyde. They can now you know I'm actually champion of disability, but it can be talked about in an open, constructive manner and knowing that they're going to be supported and listened to, as opposed to through perhaps more traditional recruitment methods, something that maybe they not necessarily want to talk about. And um, just a final cut, I often find myself that the individual applying for a job doesn't know they can ask for reasonable adjustments. They might not know what a reasonable adjustment is. They might think by asking for a reasonable adjustment, it's giving them a fair advantage. It's not. Um, this All we're doing for reasonable adjustments is giving equity. Uh, for everyone. So, um, yes, it's important to permeate down, but we can all do things together as individuals daily. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Gary, can I come to you next on that on that same question on how important do you feel it is if sort of higher level management or a board or a CEO has buy in um, and how that filters down to the rest of an organisation? Um, well, I don't really have a strong view on it, but I suppose I, I think it is important. Yeah, um, I think you know management views are very important. Um, I'm trying to think of past employers. You know, um, I think if the management doesn't care, then you know the employees aren't going to care. Um, so yeah, when it comes to adjustments and treating people fairly and equally, um, I think it is important, and especially when it comes to complaints and things like that. Um, in HR, I think it's very important that people are listened to, and that has to come from the management because I think that certainly in some work's happen, and you know, it's sort of you know just suck it up kind of attitude. Um, and I think it's so if your management's like that, then you know it's not going to it's not very good. It's not going to improve. So yeah, I think it's important that the management buy into it um, and see see through the whole organisation. Great, thank you. Paula, can I come to you next and then I'll come to come to Brian last? Yes, I think it's, it's very important. Um, and for us, you know, it's made a huge difference uh, in our ability to effect change within the organisation and to effect progress. Um, and it's not because if it wasn't there, um, you know, it's not because people are doing it because they have to or they've now been told by management, but it's about the ability of senior management to make it a priority. When I think when people are juggling so many competing priorities, you know, it can be very easy to default to doing what we've always done when we're pressed for time, and um, to not take that little bit of extra time and care and things like recruitment processes. Um, you know, or you know, whatever the whatever it might be, if it, or the point that I made about building it into our roles, you know, is thinking about our customers. What is the what's the transaction we're looking to have with our customer? What is the call to action that we're making of them? What's the process they have to go through? How accessible is that for them? Where can we make these adjustments? So I think, um, you know, in the absence of it being made a priority. You know, there's a tendency that you'll have a, you'll have many other priorities, and those will be the ones that lead your day. So I think. With senior management um, and chief executives, you know, really giving something their backing and, and setting targets and objectives around it, and making it a formal part of senior managers' um, performance objectives, 
it, you know, it just keeps it front of mind. It helps with that process of affecting change um, because, you know, as Alex said, it, it is something that's that's iterative that we need to be constantly working away at, to be thinking about, and, and crucially to be trying to think about from the very outset of whatever it is we're focusing on. You know, if it's an event we're holding, if it's a new project or product. Um, thinking about inclusion from the outset for all underrepresented groups and trying to make sure that it's been built in in that way, um, given considerations. I think they have a, you know, a huge ability to influence mindsets uh, internally in that sense. And finally, on this one, Brian. Yeah, I mean, I think senior management buy-in is very important, but actually, I think the most important thing is what you talked about is how that filters down to actual changes in practice because I'm aware of quite a number of quite large sometimes public sector organisations which have fantastic written policies on workplace diversity and on how they are a disability confident employer and so on and that doesn't translate into actual changes in their recruitment practice and some employers who have really you know workforces which really are lacking diversity and don't have appropriate representation of disabled people, sometimes organisations which you will know, have all the policies and, and the paperwork in place. Some of this is about you know, the people who are actually doing the recruitment and about the people who would actually be providing the workplace support adjustments really being on board with this. And I think it's also about you know, the kind of why would an organisation be doing this? If this is something which is posed upon staff, People feel that they're doing it because they've been told to do it because it's now company policy. Then that's never going to be sustainable in the long run. What we really need is all levels of staff buying into this because they see it as a really worthwhile thing to do because it's actually going to benefit the organisation and it's going to benefit them and benefit you know all the employees within the organisation. So I think if you have a an organisational culture where the focus is on you know let's actually have buy-in as to why we're doing this and there's really good business reasons for doing it, you're much more likely to see real change in, in practice. And if it's just something that's imposed top down as seen as, you know, corporate social responsibility or something we need to be seen to be doing, then there's ways that it can be undermined or just, you know, a sidetracked. So for me it's about how we get the buy-in of all levels of staff. Excellent, thank you. We're now going to move on to questions from our audience. So the first one we have is from um, Stephen McMurray, who says, people with disabilities often have a lot of experience, knowledge and skills, which are relevant to many workplaces, yet I suspect these attributes are simply not captured in the recruitment process. How can we improve this? So, Brian, I might pick on you again and come back to you first on this if that's if that's okay and then I'll go to I'll go to Paula after that. I think it's such a, a good question and it resonates so much with our experience that we work with so many disabled people who are you know very skilled, able people with very good qualifications and experience and so on, who sometimes don't make a successful, you know, application not through any fault of their own but because the actual recruitment selection process is, is fundamentally flawed or, or needs to be reviewed and again that's what employability is all about it's about reviewing that recruitment selection process one of the things which is a real bugbear is that so often the, there's a kind of reliance on just using the same kinds of job competencies and person specification that have always been used for the post and i think the first step here is for employers to think right radically and quite differently about right what skills and knowledge and experience is really needed for this role, and also how could people demonstrate that in a different way. So I can give you a really good kind of practical example. Social Security Scotland in their recruitment, because of their commitment to equality and diversity, made a really significant change in their recruitment, which was people could demonstrate that they had the appropriate skill set for the job by reference to their lived personal experience and from things like volunteering. And that was so liberating and so empowering because otherwise you have this situation where employers are saying, demonstrate the key skills and competencies with reference to your most recent employment. 
If you're a disabled person who, because of the disability employment gap, has been unable to find employment, you're then in that classic catch-22 situation. So I think something as simple as that, of actually looking at how could we ask candidates to demonstrate their skills and competencies in a different way, uh, is a really good way of actually having a more inclusive you know, recruitment process that would allow disabled people who maybe didn't have recent employment history but who had real great skills to be able to apply successfully for jobs. So that's one example, and there are there are others like that. That's great, thank you. So come to Paula next and then we'll go to Gary after that. Thank you. I think you know, again Brian has very much captured what our view would be of that. Um, it is about you know, not trying to have a sort of pre-configured um, set of criteria that somebody must respond to and it's about drawing out the skills that somebody and the, the ability, the aptitude of the individual. There's obviously some roles that lend themselves particularly well to that. So, you know, there's a danger we can't just do it with entry roles, but entry roles are, are helpful in the sense that you don't have to have, you know, necessarily prior skills and experience and it can be about how you would approach a situation. So you can give a real example of what, you know, the individual might encounter in the role and ask about, you know, what their approach would be towards that. You can ask for ideas from someone. You're not actually asking them to outline their previous skills and experience because one, you wouldn't necessarily expect it at that, that level, um, but also because you're trying to draw out you know, what their, their aptitude would be. I think as you go into more experienced roles where you're, there's a more defined sort of set of skills and experience that you're, you're looking for, um, again, we found there are certain roles that lend themselves well. So, you know, we're thinking about content making roles or content development roles. A lot of it again comes down to creative ability and ideas. So what we tend to do is where we can move away from asking somebody to outline their previous skills and experience is actually to answer questions about, you know, so say we say, could you give us, you know, tell us, you know, give us an idea for a program or give us, you know, to talk to us about, um, you know, what sort of content formats that you enjoy and why and how would you deconstruct those. So what we're trying to tap into there is their understanding of what makes good content and how that engages an audience. And that's obviously specific to our organisation, but we've been able, as Brian said, to think about that in a different way. Um, for something like a reporting role and you know in our, in our news content we can ask them we can offer different ways of, a, of applying so it may be prohibitive to say to somebody oh, please give us all your skills and experience but what we could do is um you know ask them to send us you know send us a, a one minute video of a story that they would report on in their local area and how they would do it and, it, and it's another way of showcasing their ability um so i think really as you say brian it's about trying to strip back this sort of preconceived way that you must demonstrate it and think of other ways and obviously um you know, as you say there's certain roles where actually somebody just coming in with a fresh perspective and idea having that diversity of thought and i think gary you alluded to it earlier you know just different backgrounds perspectives life experience that you can bring to a team and to the ideas that that team generates um those can speak for you know for so much and actually be much more important than what you were um, you know what you've necessarily been doing employment wise. It's actually about in the past. It's about how you would approach your next role. So trying to draw that out as much as possible. Great, thank you. So I'll come to come to Gary and then Alex, and then we should have time for one more question before we have to wrap up. Gary. Um, yeah, I think I agree. Um, it's just about you know making. Maybe changing the recruitment process, making it more accessible, um, you know, um, more positive action uh, stuff like Inclusion Scotland are doing with ring fencing uh, positions for disabled people, and I think you know, just in general recruitment as well, it could be things like you know, if you meet a certain criteria, then you don't have to do this test, or you know, you can go straight to an interview in certain cases, and um, stuff like that, just to you know. I don't, well, I don't like the word, but level the playing field, you know, um, for disabled candidates. Yeah, so just being open to new recruitment processes, and I think I like the the fact that the Scottish government have got a strategy as well is a good thing. Um, you know, it's being talked about in Parliament, um, and it's a national strategy. So hopefully, you know, that will see some real movement in terms of you know employment and disability, and I'll see the figures improved. 
Um, so I, I don't know what we can do, but um, hopefully um, we're doing the right things, you know, like with this discussion and you know stuff, other stuff that's going on. Great, thank you. And finally, on this one, Alex. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's basically all been said. Just you know, always question, always question why you're doing things a certain way, and can it be done a slightly different way? Um, um, just a couple, if I may, quickly. Um, picking up on Gary's point there about the extended assessment process, we worked with SDS recently for a couple of internships. But it was quite an extended recruitment process involving presentations and verbal numerical reasoning exercises. Um, stripped it back straight to interview, and uh, the successful young lady has been in the role two years now. Um, suffered from anxiety and depression, and um, freely admitted that she would not have went through that. One would not have applied. And she would not have went through that extended recruitment process. But finally, if, if I may, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about the recruitment and bringing people into the organisation. I can just very quickly touch on um, our journey through uh, as, as an organisation as an employee. And um, you know, impairments come to us at all times in our lives, and certainly as we get older, the linear progression of time brings its own. Impairments, and one in five of us in Scotland has an impairment. So, um, while it's always important to look at the recruitment process, look at your current workforce. Um, um, identify, you know, will you know? Look, um, we suggest, and uh, we've touched on it maybe slightly before, um, and then work support um, document as well, or sort of process, maybe tying it in with part of your performance review. And it's a recognition that you know we'll look at performance, but you know um, what support can we give to you um, to make you successful as you can in the role, reflecting what the barriers you face might be. And it, it's really just an audit of um, the role, the barriers you face, and the solutions as an organisation we can put in place to help you overcome those barriers. So um, recruitment is important. Looking at what we do, being smart. Trying to redefine existing ways of doing things, but also very important: look at the assets within the organisation, the people you've got, and support them because impairments come to us all at any journey, any part of our life. Thank you. Oh, absolutely, and I think that's that's actually a really important a really important point to make that nobody nobody really knows at what point an impairment may be may be thrust upon them through various. Um, various uh, makers of of ill health and and disability and impairment inducing events. So I think that's that's something really important for for all employers to remember that it's not just for new employees coming into organisations, but you are actually potentially helping to support individuals that are already in your organisation that may, as you said, Alex, come to come to an impairment in time. Um, if anybody wants to reflect on that in the answer to this next question, um, feel free to. The the last question I want to pick up on um, is from Audrey Cameron. So the findings of the employment research project on deaf sign language, particularly about the findings of the employment research project on deaf sign language users, um, employers recognised that where there are deaf sign language users working in their organisations. They are mostly in operational levels, so progression and career development are key challenges. So, how do we support this um, this group in particular, but probably generally, how do we support um, disabled people out of those entry level um, positions and into more promoted posts within organisations, whether they be within private companies or within um, public organisations? As well, so um, Paula, can I come to you first on that one, and then I will come to Gary next. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, that's a key point, um, and I, and actually, it does it does you know correlate to what you were speaking about there, Alex, as well, um, in terms of your existing colleagues and people who are who are already um, working with you, who are already in your industry, who have a depth of skills and experience, who, but who are perhaps facing challenges to progression. Um, and, then, and at the same time, running in tandem with that, we know that we have an underrepresentation at senior levels, again, across all underrepresented 
well, not necessarily across all underrepresented groups, but it's common that it can be across all underrepresented groups, and it's it's good to understand in your organisation which particular groups that might relate to. Um, so I think you know, looking at what you can put in place as a business, one of the things that we have done is developed what we call an accelerator program, and it helps to have a you need to have for us, you know, for that to feel authentic to the individual. Because again, um, you know, I think Gary, you you sort of alluded to it as well. You're you're very mindful. Um, you talked about about leveling the playing field. You know, that this is it's at, this is something that individuals have absolutely earned with the experience that they have under their belt. But it's about removing those um, those those barriers that have inadvertently arisen for whatever that may be within that environment that's not allowed them to, to thrive and move on to the next level. Um, so where we're actually identifying roles at a senior uh, level where we have a, a gap, you know, we perhaps don't have uh, representation and we know that we have colleagues within our business who have those skills, looking at how we can almost fast track their development. Um, and we're finding that that's coming in probably at the kind of mid level. So it's, you know, it's not an entry level point, it's about taking people who are already in and already have a depth of experience in their own right and actually are um, working independently in their, their role with the experience that they've gained, but actually looking at how we can um, broaden that further and, and move them on to the next level. And that, you know, I think for many organisations, that's likely to be quite small scale, but it can make, it's, it absolutely doesn't detract from the, how worthwhile it is for, for those individuals. Um, you know, we're talking, you know, kind of a handful of, of people within our business, but it's about taking them from where they are now to actually through to an identified need within the business that also provides that career development for them. And that involves going through, you know, a series of different secondments, um, some of which are sideways moves, some of which are taking on more responsibility, but it's about fast tracking the process of um, them having that exposure so that when they get to that role, we're aiming for within two years of starting um, that journey, that they, they do feel they absolutely have had that exposure and the ability to get that experience under their bail, albeit um, at a slightly quicker rate. So that's one of the ways that we're trying to approach that. That's great. Thank you. We've got about just under three minutes left. Um, so you've got about a minute each left to answer this question if, if possible. So Gary, I'll come to you next and then Alex, then Brian. Well, I agree. I think I think it's um, it's a cultural thing. It's a cultural shift that's got to happen. Um, and the more and more we chip away at it, the faster it will happen. And uh, I think you know, seeing disabled people in higher positions will make it happen faster. Um, you know, and I think that's improving as well. Like the last Scottish Parliament only had one uh, disabled parliamentarian, and now this one's. I'm not sure the number, but it's definitely more than one. So it's improving. Uh, I think you know. We're starting to get there, and uh, you know, hopefully, you know, in a decade's time, you know, things will be much better, and we'll be an outlier in the world for um, employment, um, employment and uh, disability. Absolutely, I hope so too, and I hope we have many more um, disabled colleagues next session as well. Um, Alex, and then Brian, please. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very conscious of time running here. Um, I think just alluded to it earlier on. Um, you know, certainly looking at the development of colleagues um, within an organisation, regular in work support um, reviews, tied in with the performance review as well, to capture just life changes um, as they develop, and then access to work. Brian talked about it right at the start. Um, UK wide program not utilised very much. They can provide financial and tangible support to an individual or an organisation to make it more accessible and inclusive. So those two things alone really help. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. And finally, Brian. Yeah, I'll keep it very quick. I mean, I was just delighted to hear Paula's example. I think that's a really great example of an employer being creative and just doing things differently. And you know, if more employers were to do that, we'd go a heck of a long way to reducing the disability employment gap. And I think for me, this whole thing about people being kind of trapped in the kind of lower level entry jobs, so much of it is because they don't get the same access to training and development opportunities as their, as their non-disabled peers. And that means that you know there are employers who 
are not making those training and progression opportunities accessible to disabled people. So that needs to be that that needs to be addressed. And I think Paul has you know, given a, a fabulous answer about how that can be done in a very kind of creative, you know, radically different way of doing it. Uh, and you know, I think that that's the way forward, to be honest. Thank you so much for that. I'm sure we could have continued this discussion for most of the evening, but unfortunately we've got to we've got to end there. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and making such a contribution to our panel, brought to you in partnership with Inclusion Scotland and Disability Equality Scotland. I'd also like to thank our panel, Alex Wilson, Gary McLean, Paula Gray and Brian Scott for giving up their time to take part. Thanks too to our BS, BSL interpretation team of Jill Wood and Helen Dunipace. May I also take this opportunity to remind you that you can still catch the second half of the In Conversation with writer and environmentalist George Monbiot, um, which is happening also online. I think if we can post a link to that in the chat, we will. For the next four days, we have many more panels at the Festival of Politics on mental health. Safe cities, greenwashing, and fast fashion. And I do hope that you can join with these discussions. But once again, thank you for joining us this evening and enjoy the rest of the Festival of Politics. <laughs>